I remember um, Swami Brahmananda was there in Kashi in Banaras and uh, the Holy Mother, Masharada Devi was also there. So she asked somebody to go and ask Rakhal, Swami Brahmananda, why do you need to worship the Divine Mother? You have the Upanishads. You have Vedanta, Drik Drishya Vivek, Panchadashi, Aparoksha Anubhuti and all of that. You have the direct teaching. So you just practice that. You discriminate. I am not the body. I am not the mind. And then you realize that uh, I am Brahman. You realize your true identity. But uh, it's not that easy. And you might say, we know Swami. We have been coming to the Vedanta Society for decades now. <laughs> it's not that easy. Yes. So grace is necessary. That's what all spiritual seekers throughout the ages have realized. We call it grace, kripa. Uh -huh. So that grace comes from the Divine Mother. Uh, so it is. So Swami Brahmananda asked him, and he said, "Brahma gyan chabi kati The keys to the enlightenment, keys to Brahma gyana, the knowledge of Brahman, is in the hands of the Divine Mother. Out of emotion speaking, out of devotion to Masharada, because Sri Ramakrishna was his guru, so Masharada is uh, the wife of the guru, so reverence to her. That's why she he's saying out uh, the keys to Brahma Jnana in her hands. Four or five thousand years before that, Vagambrini uh, she has said, Yam Kama Tam Ugram Tam Tamugram Krinomi. I raise that one, the one who worships. With any particular desire, I raise that one to the heights of excellence, to the Everest of excellence. Whether you want to be an enlightened one, whether you want to be a rishi, whether you want to be the greatest intellectual who ever lived, it comes from my blessings. It's true. I have seen it um, that, yes, even with the slightest bit of effort, but by the grace of the Divine Mother, immediately, something that we do not deserve at all, it's entirely possible. Entirely possible. That also you can get by yourself, by the grace of God again, but with enormous amount of effort and careful practice for maybe lifetimes. It can take time. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna said in Banaras, which is the land of uh, Vishwanatha, Shiva, and Annapurna, the Divine Mother. So Annapurna is the one who, who gives food. So the language Sri Ramakrishna used is that no one goes hungry in the land of Annapurna. You will be fed, but some are fed in the morning, some in the afternoon, some in the late afternoon, some have to wait till evening. What is morning, afternoon, late afternoon, evening? Doesn't seem much. You have to wait. Little hungry you may be. This is the life, the day of the universe. You know? At the beginning of creation, in the middle of creation where we are, and towards the dusk and darkness which comes at the end of the universe. One may have to wait <laughs> many, many lifetimes. I'm reminded of this little, silly little joke I had read uh, in Reader's Digest many, many years ago. So this man, he um, prays to God and God appears before him. What do you want? This man is very clever. He says, I don't want much. Lord, you are infinite. Eh? You have everything. Oh, um, like one penny uh, of yours is equal to a, a billion dollars uh, for us. All I want from you is one of one. Give me one penny from your treasure house, uh, which is equal to a billion dollars for me. That's all I want. That's easy for you, isn't it, Lord? The Lord says, "You are right. One penny is equal to your billion dollars. I'll give it to you. Wait for one second. <laughs> so, how many lifetimes that will be? So, there was one devotee of the Holy Mother, very devoted person. Um, he, he got initiation from the Holy Mother, uh, Ma Sharada Devi. And long after she had passed on, uh, he, he suffered a lot in his life. Many family problems, health problems, and even family problems. Terrible stuff. But all throughout, he maintained his peace of mind, devotion, with a, in a sort of serene heart he saw through all of that. He used to say that when I got initiation, the mother looked at me carefully and she said, she warned me, said, Baba, my child, I see that you have a little suffering in your life. And she did this. 
this is a way the bengali uh, women this speak they say when they mean a little they mean this and he's and he says this is what is little suffering if he had said if you have a lot of suffering in your life what would have happened <laughs> Uh, what was they, this little suffering is? I'm devastated by this. <laughs> then she goes on to say, "Aham." Again, or every verse starts with "Aham." I is completely confident, established in a divinity. "Aham Rudra ya Dhanurata Nomi Brahma Dvise Sharave Hantava U." Ah, you know the, all the obstacles that come on the path of enlightenment i remove them i'm proactive i put the arrows on the and on the bow of the mighty rudra uh, who uh, destroys all the enemies of the spiritual seekers that means every obstacle that comes in spiritual life i'm on your side never fear everything will be overcome and you will attain to god realization i am the one she, how what look at the poetry i fix the arrows on on the bow of rudra the mighty rudra uh, who takes aim at all the obstacles and the enemies of those who seek brahman Brahm so f i do that then another interesting part aham janaya samadam krinomi aham dyava prithivi ya vishesha it's like a war cry i make war for the benefit of humanity for the benefit of my children I make war. I pervade the earth and the sky, and I make war. Now this is interesting. Let's face it squarely. Throughout history, tribes have fought against other tribes. Cities and nation states have fought against other nation, uh, other cities and nation states. And everyone has claimed God is on my side. And not only that, even further and even worse, I am fighting for the sake of God. I was um, I saw in, at Harvard University there is a beautiful memorial church. Um, so if you go in there, uh, you see on one wall the names of all the alumni of Harvard who were killed in the First World War, Second World War. It's all written there, ex-students. One whole wall is full of that those names. You will see interesting. Some of them I noticed carefully. They are German names, so they were German students who studied at Harvard went back and fought on the german side against uh, americans so it's written name so and so within bracket enemy <laughs> <laughs> so um, but still student our student yeah. but anyway <laughs> now now notice uh, notice the um amazing confluence it's so interesting church university war uh, religion education warfare all coming together in such an amazing way it's it's a fact we cannot turn our eyes from it that god has been invoked in the worst of human enterprises a war that's a wrong use of religion that's an abuse of religion but that spark is there still it's also a fact that um, that there is this spirit which comes forward to protect humanity in its worst times when, when the forces of evil are strong and powerful in the uh, united states here here you say the last good war was the second world war they say yeah. and we have we, we don't have bill here today so we actually have a second world war veteran someone who fought in the last uh, gr good war what is this last good war where clearly the forces arrayed against you are detrimental to civilization are detrimental to the to the um, universal order and so she says i take i make war for the protection of of people janaya samadam krinomi i engage in war for the protection of people and per i pervade the earth and the skies the latest concept of air land battle i think <laughs> then highest advaita mama yoni rapswanta samudre she says my womb is the vast ocean of satchidananda from which emerges emerges the universe in which plays the universe and disappears the universe back again ashtavakra sings aham mai anantamaham bodau vishwa vichi swabhavata 
Udetu vastamayatu name vriddhi navakshati. I am this infinite ocean of existence consciousness. In this ocean, small waves come up. They are no, nothing but these entire universes which come up. Let the waves arise, let the waves subside. The ocean does not increase or decrease thereby. Similarly, I, this, she is saying here, I am that infinite ocean of existence consciousness. The universe emerges like waves in me. Uh, and so when the wave is coming up, isn't the wave still a part of the ocean? Certainly. Isn't the wave still in the water? Of course, it's nothing other than water. And when it disappears, where does it disappear to? Water again. So that uh, commentator Mahanamabrata Brahmachari, he writes very touchingly. What does this mean? This means we are forever on the lap of the mother. It's not that we have come from the mother, now we are distant from the mother. One day, what do God knows where we are going. No, we have come from the mother. We are forever on the lap of the mother. And at death we go back to the mother in the individual sense and in the sense of the entire cosmos. The cosmos lies in the lap of the mother. That is the meaning of this. In me, the infinite consciousness, the universe floats. Then the conclusion. Soaring, what poetry. Um, it's really moving. Ahameva vataiva pravavami arabhamana bhuvanani vishwa. At the beginning of the universe, she says, Arabhamana Bhuvanani Vishwa, when the worlds were created, I blew through that like a breeze. Blew through that like a breeze later, much later. In Taittiriya Upanishad it is said that Tat Srishtva Tadeva Nupravishat. Having created that, I entered into it. What does that mean? It's like, imagine the waves coming up and the water says, having created the waves, I enter into it. Which means, I, the waves are nothing but me. The universe is nothing but me. I sustain all the universe by giving it existence. Sat existence. By giving it light, awareness, chit. And giving it meaning, ananda. So all existence, life and death is sat. All knowledge, awareness, experience is chit. All meaning and love and seeking and purpose is ananda. And how she's expressing it, she says, as a breeze I blew through the universe at its beginning, investing it with existence and light and meaning. And then she says, even more stunning, the conclusion is stunning. This entire universe comes from me, exists in my lap and disappears into me. Uh, I have invested it with existence, light and meaning. It is nothing to me. She says, I transcend it completely. He says, Paro diva parayena. Beyond this is the transcendent sky of existence consciousness bliss, which is my real form. And I pervade this universe also. Swami Vivekananda said, We Hindus worship a transcendent immanent God. Satchidananda Brahman, which is entirely beyond this universe, beyond time, space uh, and causation, beyond Maya, is the reality. In uh, Vedanta Sarva, the first thing we learn, Vastu Satchidananda Madhvayam Brahma, the reality is existence, consciousness, place, non-dual Brahman. Uh, Agyanadi Sakala Jarasamuha Avastu, from ignorance downwards, from Maya downwards, everything else is an appearance. She's saying this here. And yet she says, whatever else you see in the universe, that also is I. I transcend it all and yet I am in and through all of it. Just yesterday I was seeing, a very nice article has come out. Einstein believed in Spinoza's God. But what is this Spinoza's God? And the description is something pretty close to this. What Spinoza was struggling to say, see God cannot be entirely transcendent. So he was struggling in the orthodox Jewish interpretation at that time. So God is beyond all of this. And it has to be. If God is not beyond all of this, then God is limited and imperfect and terrible. So God has to be perfect. So perfect means you have to save God from this mess. <laughs> so God is beyond this. Yes, this is a mess. Born, birth, messy. Life is messy. Death is even worse. There is so much evil and suffering in this world. If this is God, it's not a good, particularly good God. It's a miserable God then. So God has to be transcendent. But then that creates terrible problems. What is the problem? The problem is that then you have two realities. God and this world. 
a perfect god somewhere we have no idea where when how because it's beyond all where beyond all when beyond all how time space causation beyond all that desha kala vastu parichheda shunya in sanskrit beyond the limitation of space time and causation in object and then you have this imperfect universe this is the reality which we are experiencing right now you have two what is the problem the problem is then that god you are talking about it becomes strictly limited it becomes too small why because there is something that god is not the moment you say that you admit the existence of a second reality apart from god to that extent god becomes less this is the problem with all the dualistic theistic religions of the world that god is something else immediately you are saying god is not god that god is not worth worshiping it's a limited entity worse the moment you divorce god from this universe then god exists only as a matter of speculation and belief you have no more doors to the divinity anymore you know by looking at this universe all theologians for 1000 years christian theologians um, islamic theologians the dualistic hindu theologians they've been desperately trying to prove god look at this universe by design by the first cause argument this and that modern science laughs at all of that every one of your arguments can be refuted or at least diffused by modern science not this amazing diversity of life there must be an intelligence behind it Darwinian evolution tells you, and modern neo-Darwinians will tell you, we can demonstrate through computer models and all how just by the force of, you know, uh, evolution, survival of the fittest, random mutation, genetic mutation, you can have this tremendous diversity of life. You don't need uh, uh, some kind of intelligence to explain all this. No, just the existence of the universe. There must be a first cause. Yes. the first cause can be explained by um, or at least hinted at by quantum mechanics as a so called you know the emergence of um, quantum uh, in, in the you know the before the big bang uh, quantum particles emerging matter anti matter matter disappearing some of it emerges and does not disappear back again and emerges into a full fledged universe i'm quoting michio kaku here the god equation we can explain it no god in the process at all you cannot really seriously argue from the just this material universe to god not today in 21st century it doesn't work those old proofs of they are very interesting proofs of the existence of god but they they are not convincing they are rather underwhelming not overwhelming <laughs> you cannot argue from this. then what happens that god of belief the god of speculation the theistic dualistic other god becomes very weak Alan Watts says, "When we have a pot, a clay pot, and then you are told that there is a cause of this clay pot. It's called clay. There is something called clay, which is the cause of this clay pot. Something called God, which is the cause of this universe. Now, if you look for the clay other than the clay pot, other than the pot, if you're looking for clay, other than this universe, if you're looking for a cause outside." other than the party looking for the clay alan watt calls it the crack pot idea <laughs> he says you go one step forward and say that which is the cause of this universe that which is the reality of this universe is right here and now it is immanent in this universe but because it's also transcendent it can be perfect it can be eternal it can be can be beyond all uh, good and evil cause and effect and yet be the cause of this uh, be the substance or the reality of this universe the ground of this universe mystics in all the world religions came to this understanding it's only in in um, advaita vedanta and arguably in some forms of mahayana buddhism that a whole framework developed it became mainstream non dualism became mainstream so non dualism at the core of the idea of non dualism that there is only one reality without a second even when everything else is appearing even then there's only one non dual reality the, at the core of that idea is the transcendent immanent god 
long before the dialectics of advaita siddhi and khandana khanda kadya the extraordinary difficult text of advaita vedanta long before them long before shankara acharya who wrote the commentaries on the upanishads gaudapada who proved non causality ajatavada uh, the, the theory of the non origination of the universe long before them when the brahma sutras uh, long before that the upanishads who declared these truths long before that millennia before that is this the voice of this lady who is saying the ultimate reality is transcendent and immanent how do you know i am that reality she has no qualms about saying it but as you are also you d- i know it you do not know it that's the difference paro diva parayena i am in the transcendent world Oh, so you are completely different from this world, and she says, "Pitivye eta vati mahina sambhu." And in and through this entire world of the heaven and the earth, I pervade all of that and remain established in my own glory. That is the reality of Vagambhini, that that Rishi whom we salute today, who appears in the form of the Divine Mother Durga, who is the light in all of us, who has given us the highest knowledge. who is at the foundation of of religion the foundation of civilization the entire human project the foundation of this universe and the ultimate highest teaching of how you can realize that truth and go beyond suffering go beyond death realize the destination of the destiny of human life so salutations to her on this uh, occasion